On today's podcast, we're talking about navigating the generation gap within company cultures and the commitment to set the temperature and breathe good oxygen into cultures that are attractive and healthy for all ages. And as we dive into the research, we might be a little surprised related to stereotypes and perhaps not surprised by what people of all ages actually want. But before we dive into today's topic, let's pause, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Thermostat with Jason Barger. If you're currently on a commute, a walk, or just a micro break in your day, glad you're making time to step back, to think, and to reflect on the next steps on your journey. I've never been more convinced the best leaders and team cultures in the world are the ones that make time to step back, breathe in good oxygen, and calibrate their thermostat. I hope today's conversation leaves you feeling grounded and inspired. Now let's dive into today's topic to engage our minds and hearts in order to authentically lead and create compelling cultures wherever we are in the world. Hey everyone, it's Jason and welcome back to the Thermostat Podcast. Wherever you are, however you're coming to the podcast today, welcome in. So glad you are here uh, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. So glad you're here. We're in season eight. We've got over 240 episodes, so many great topics, chats with thought leaders from around the world, great things that if you can't find something that resonates with you, then you aren't looking hard enough. So uh, welcome in. So glad you're here. I hope you go back, check out some of those past episodes. Uh, I know you'll uh, enjoy that. If you are one of the OGs that have been with us from the very beginning of this podcast, so glad this continues to add value and contribute to your life and your work, and glad that you keep coming back, and this is a part of your weekly practice of listening to the pod. Uh, my commitment to all of you, anybody who's listened to the pod, my, my commitment as always is I want this to be a place for you to, to take a step back, to breathe, to think about the, the type of person, the type of leader uh, you know, calibrate your own thermostat in your life and your work and think about the culture that you're trying to create with the people around you. And so I hope that this these topics breathe a little good oxygen into you and help you calibrate your own thermostat and help you for whatever the next stretch is uh, in your life and your work. So, so glad you're here. If you'll do me the quick favor before we dive into today's topic, if you will stop for a second, just rate the podcast five stars, whatever platform you're on, that helps people find the podcast, helps share it with more people. If you'll re review the podcast, so if you'll, if there's an episode or, or, or the podcast in general, but it, or, you know, something that resonates with you, your own authentic words, why is this important? Why are these messages helpful in the world that we're in today? That helps the algorithms share it with more people. And then beyond rating and reviewing, which please do that. Thanks to everybody who takes a moment to do that. That's super helpful. Um, but also you personally to share it with the people around you, whether that's an episode that resonates with you that you share on social media, whether that's you, you know, send it to an episode to your team or your family or friends or colleagues or whoever that is for you. And you say, let's listen to this and then let's talk about it and talk about how it relates to us and, and the culture we're trying to create, whatever that is for you, every time you share it, that that amplifies these messages and shares it further in the world. So thanks to everybody that takes a moment to do that, because that's truly how these things spread. And, and uh, I'm grateful. That's the whole point of this is to share some good messages out in the world. So thanks to everybody that does that. There are many themes that I hear and see within teams and organizations across industries all the time. I am so fortunate to be in the role of somebody who speaks at a lot of events, a lot of companies. I, I, I have organizations and companies that I work with on a longer term basis of helping to develop their leadership team or help them strategically and intentionally develop the culture they're trying to create. So I'm in and out of organizations all the time and fortunate to be partnering with some great people and great places to try to authentically create these compelling cultures. And there are common themes and topics and things that I see all the time. As you've heard me say before, all an organization is, is a collection of human beings, a collection of humans who have come together to accomplish something that they can't do on their own. And as we know, human beings are imperfect. All of us are. I'm, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So human beings are imperfect 
and every organization is too, because all an organization is is a collection of humans. So we're t- no organization is perfect. But the best organizations, they understand and are committed to developing the ecosystem of the culture their humans live and work in. And one common theme or questions that I often get is about within those cultural ecosystems, how do we navigate the generational gap within our company culture? With so many different ages and generations and approaches colliding in the workplace, how do we build cultures where we all can thrive? So on today's podcast, we're talking about navigating the generation gap within company cultures and the commitment to set the temperature and breathe good oxygen into cultures that are attractive and healthy for all ages. And as we dive into the research, we might be a little surprised related to stereotypes and perhaps not surprised by what people of all ages actually want. But before we dive into today's topic, let's pause, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. I want to share with you the great excitement for this year's Thermostat Cultures live event on Friday, November 8th, 2024. As you know, this event that I've hosted over the last seven years has been an inspiring day of development focused on authentic leadership and culture. I've been joined by powerful voices like Howard Bihar, former president of Starbucks, Shane Battier, two-time NBA champion, Jenny Britton, founder of Jenny's Ice Cream, Jessica Jackley, co-founder of Kiva, Cameron Mitchell from Cameron Mitchell Restaurants, Greg Oden, and on and on and on. This year, Thermostat Cultures Live will be a hybrid event. There will be a powerful VIP in-person experience with limited seating in Columbus, Ohio, and a virtual experience for those wanting to participate remotely. I am so excited about this year's lineup of voices joining me, such as New York Times bestselling author of Atomic Habits, James Clear, and founder of The Theory of Enchantment, Chloe Valdery. So please visit thermostatculturelive.com or jasonvbarger.com to learn more. And I hope you'll help share the word and join these conversations that are the currency for change. Rally your team, reserve your seats, thermostatculturelive.com. If you're an avid listener to this podcast, then you've heard me tell the story of a one-time volunteering at, at my kid's you know, field day years ago when they were in elementary school, my daughter's field day. And I've told this story on the pod, so I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but I'll reference it. So if you want to go back and, 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 and hear it and listen to it, you can hear the, the whole thing. Uh, but you you remember this image that I've shared is I, I got uh, during this field day, I got thrown to the, to the uh, tug of war station. And while I was at the tug of war station and all these elementary school kids, every 15 minutes, a new class of kids would run over and my job was to entertain them for 15 minutes and have them play, you know, tug of war. And what I quickly realized is tug of war uh, really loses its luster after about two minutes. And then you've got 13 minutes to kill before the next buzzer goes off. And so I started to quickly on my feet, started to think about, all right, how could I keep them entertained? And so I started saying, hey, who wants to do boys versus girls? And of course, they'd, they'd go crazy and the little boys would start pumping their chest and flexing their little muscles. And, you know, they thought they were going to dominate. And meanwhile, I'd walk over and I'd quietly talk to the group of girls and I'd say, hey, organize yourselves on the rope and, and you know, get everybody like a zipper fashion down the rope. And they'd all look up and listen at me and actually pay attention while the guys are over there fist bumping and chest, you know, you know, talking about how they're going to dominate the girls and just little punky little dudes. I'm, I can say that because I am I was once one and still am at heart, I guess. And uh, but the girls, as, as they were getting organized on the rope, then I would say, hey, pick out a captain. And the captain, when I say on your marks, get set, go, captain, yell out one, two, three, and everybody pull on three, one, two, three, everybody pull. You got it? And all the little girls would look up at me like, yeah, we got it, we got it, we got it. Meanwhile, the guys were totally disorganized and all, you know, talking about how they're going to dominate. And as soon as I would start this every time, on your marks, get set, go, the guys would come flying in at the last second. They weren't organized. They were grabbing the rope there. And they started to pull with all their might, but they were often kind of pulling in different directions than each other. And it was creating this kind of tension on the rope. And so one kid's pulling it this way, another one's pulling it slightly differently. And so they wouldn't get anywhere. 
And sure enough, the girls on the girls' side, nice and organized on the rope and zipper fashion, the captain would yell out one, two, three, and everybody'd pull, and one, two, three, pull, and in about three pulls, the girls would win every time, and the boys would absolutely freak out. And I watched this all morning long, this same thing happened, and all the, the kids just freaking out, and then I'd say, all right, line up and do it again. But it was because of the organization, and it was because of the teamwork, and it was because of understanding your role on the rope, when we're pulling it, how we're pulling it, and in alignment with each other. And as I was doing that, you know, watching this that in real time that day, I kept thinking about the image as it relates to many organizations in the world today, that so many organizations have so many different people every day running in and grabbing the rope. And certainly many different generations grabbing the rope that all have an idea about how we ought to be pulling it and and slightly different approach to it. And oftentimes, or our stereotypes of the way we think about each other, and oftentimes that creates tension on the rope. And so we're pulling the rope, but oftentimes we're pulling it kind of against each other rather than in alignment with each other. And I just thought that was a really powerful Uh, Example, because obviously the best teams, the best organizations are the ones that understand and their alignment on the rope. They understand the role they're there to play. They understand what direction we're trying to pull it and why we're approaching it the way we're doing it. And then everybody is bringing their own individual strengths and gifts in alignment with each other to pull it in the same direction. So I thought it was a powerful image for organizations, for teams, and certainly when we start to talk about the generational gaps that exist within organizations. So I'll share that story as a lead into today's conversation because it's no secret that the relationships between people and their work and between employees and employers have, has changed dramatically in recent years. The makeup itself of the workforce is changing rapidly, and the generational demographics in the workplace are evolving. A recent McKinsey and Company study uh, reported that by the year 2025, Gen Z, which is 18 to 24-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 26, 27, somewhere in in that range, 18 to 27-year-olds, we'll call it, could com- they, they can comprise more than one quarter of the global workforce. I'll say that again. By the year 2025, Gen Z could comprise more than one quarter of the global workforce. So the landscape is changing, and therefore we ought to think about some important elements to this shift with Gen Z growing at such a rapid rate, millennials already being the the largest generation in the U.S. workforce now, we ought to be thinking about, if we aren't, how are we approaching the generations uh, that exist? So the first thing I want to do today is I want to make sure that we define the generations because we oftentimes hear these labels and throw them around, but we don't stop and say, all right, hold on, who, who are we categorizing as what? So let me just do that quickly. So defining generations, let's get clear on the different terminology on these current generations in the workforce. So Gen Z, what's referred to as Gen Z, is that people right now that are in that 18 to 27-year-old range. Gen Z, 18 to 27-year-old. Younger millennials, millennials get kind of split up into two, two categories now. It's really a large group of people, again, the largest group of of humans in the U.S., uh, you know, actually in the global labor force right now are millennials. But younger millennials are in that kind of 27 to 34 range, and older millennials will be in that kind of 37 to 44. So, you know, if you say 28 to 44 is kind of that millennial stage, Gen X, which I would be a Gen Xer, are the anybody from 40, 45 to 54 range. And then young, younger baby boomers are kind of at 55 to 64 uh, age. And of course, we know that older people exist and older people exist certainly in the workforce, but many of those are in kind of trans, transition even as we speak, those kind of baby boomers that we've heard so much about. But I wanted to make sure that we did that of defining the generations as we begin today. The second point I want to make is dropping stereotypes. 
dropping stereotypes is really important when we're talking about navigating the generation gap within company cultures. Every time, you know, generations, this idea of generations comes up in the workplace, so do stereotypes. And people right away, they jump right into, you know, the fact that Gen Z, they only want to text is something people will say. Or baby boomers, they don't know how to text, you know, and these generations, they'll throw around these kind of stereotypes about the different generations. Or millennials are narcissistic and lazy, and Gen X and boomers are hardworking. Well, we, we, we spend a lot of time and energy and, in my opinion, kind of wasted fuel within our cultures and within our teams and organizations, kind of burning and spending so much time you know, labeling across these big groups of people these kind of stereotypes. And actually, as you dive into the research on workplace behaviors, the Harvard Business Review, you know, report would tell us that in 20 different studies, 20 different studies with nearly 20,000 people across generations involved, revealed that there are very small and inconsistent differences in job attitudes when they're comparing generational groups, which is quite fascinating because we have these kind of, you know, paint we paint by a, a brush these kind of broad strokes of generational stereotypes. But actually, when you look at the research across generations around job attitudes and performance, they actually, you know, they're, the, 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 they're very small and inconsistent differences. The studies found that although individual people may experience changes in their needs, in their interests, in their preferences and strengths over the course of their career, sweeping age differences, you know, focused only on their depending on the age of the person or the generation alone, don't really seem to be supported. So the research says that really when you look at it very closely, it doesn't really seem to be supported. And what does exist, what they identify, are the sweeping stereotypes we perpetuate within our organizations that label one generation as a whole. When you look at the data and the actual behaviors, there aren't many incons- – there aren't a whole big gaps or inconsistency between different age, age groups – But what does exist are the stereotypes that don't always line up with the behavior. So data doesn't back up these sweeping behaviors, but the stereotypes often impact the way we view or approach each other. So actively dropping the stereotypes and finding alignment becomes a key within every team and organization. And, you know, one of the ways in which uh, a tactical thing that in in healthy and and growing cultures that many organizations have, you know, well, how do we begin to break down those stereotypes and how do we begin to align people on the rope? Somebody who's a Gen Z and somebody with a baby boomer or Gen X and a millennial is is this kind of idea of cross generational mentoring and creating these experiences where it's mentoring isn't just the older person to the younger person, that it's actually a two-way street and both generations are starting to find alignment on where are they really similar and what can they still learn from each other about how they, the slight ways in which they might approach things differently. And so cross-generational mentoring, that kind of two-way street has been one tactic that many organizations successfully have done to kind of break it, break down these stereotypes and help people kind of drop those stereotypes. The third thing that I would, I would point out as we're looking at the research and the data as it relates to navigating that generational gap within company cultures is that the very best places are feeding the ecosystem. And so let me explain what I mean by that, feeding the ecosystem of the culture. It turns out that the cultural ecosystem that people want across generations is more similar than dissimilar. You know, oftentimes, again, the stereotype is we think that one generation wants something vastly different than another. But really, as you start to look at the data and the research, the, the cultural ecosystem that people want is more similar than dissimilar. 
And so we have the opportunity to be intentional about the cultural ecosystem we are growing, we are feeding, and we are developing together. For attracting new talent, for example, to our cultures, research shows that generationally we are actually quite similar. The biggest reasons people are attracted to jobs in the world today are they are attracted to meaningful work. And what are categorized as motivating factors such as career development, flexibility, and caring leaders. And so across generations, we see these themes of what we're attracted to or or these kind of motivating factors related to, do, do I find the work meaningful? Do, is, there a, is there a path for me to develop within my career, and are they committed to my growth? Is there flexibility, which I'm going to talk more about here in a second? And also, is the experience and the culture, uh, is it caring leadership? Do I have caring leaders around me? Adequate compensation is, of course, a part of every generational desire. As you look at the data, having fair and adequate Adequate compensation is, of course, a piece of the puzzle. And across generations, you see that show up. But interestingly enough, Gen Z ranks compensation as a slightly less important factor. It's important for everybody, but it's not the driving factor for everybody. And in fact, it's not the driving factor for most. It's that those other motivating factors. But it's an important, it needs to be fair and adequate across generations, but Gen Z ranks the compensation a slightly less important factor. They recognize adequate compensation as an important factor, but they actually value flexibility, that career development, and are you investing in me and my development, meaningful work, and a safe, supportive cultures as more important elements. The value proposition for these Gen Zers is slightly different for them, but every generation is also seeking these elements of the same things, that they're seeking these motivating factors seem to be the greater value proposition. And the, the, you know, the lagging indicator is that kind of adequate and fair compensation. The fourth thing that I'll point out as we talk about navigating the, the generation gap within cultures, company cultures, is focusing on engagement. The best places are focusing on engagement. So all of this means there's an opportunity to tailor the experience to meet people's individual needs. Again, not sweeping generalizations about groups of people, but to tailor the experience to meet individual needs, individual desires as a part of your culture rather than just one big, giant, sweeping generalization. The opportunity exists to be better to understand each person you're hiring. So how can we better understand, not just see a young person as one, you know, you know, sweeping generalization, but each person that we hire, what, is, what are the motivating factors for that person? What are their motivating factors, and how could their experience be tailored to maximize their experience and the impact that they can have in the role that you're hiring them for. And so some of the other research related to why do people, not just uh, I shared earlier, why are people attracted to jobs? Well, why do people leave jobs or seek different opportunities? And a lot of it comes down to they become disengaged. And so research says that they are searching, when people leave jobs, they're searching actually for more caring leaders. So they've had an experience. You've heard that the adage that people don't leave jobs, they leave people. They've had, they've had an experience where they're, they're, so they're searching for, what am I looking for? I'm looking for more caring leaders. I, of course, again, I want fair and adequate compensation. That's, you know, a baseline, a part of it. But what I'm looking for when the research shows, what are they looking for? They want caring leaders. They want career development, which where they feel like, honestly, the team, the leader, the organization is committed to helping them develop and grow. And they want to, the research shows that they want to know that you are interested in their needs and their desires related to flexibility, but also what they value most in their life. And so it's really not rocket science. The research shows across generations 
that there's a de- desire to be a part of cultures where leaders care, employees are developed, and their individual lives are acknowledged and supported, their life outside of work, what's important to them. And then, of course, adequate compensation that's fair exists. So when we think about navigating the generation gap within company cultures, we got to know even what do we got to define the generations. We've got to understand that maybe the research is actually telling us we need to drop the stereotypes. We need to think about how are we feeding the cultural ecosystem on the people that we're bringing into the organization and how we're how we're then developing them once they're there and then focusing on engaging with them individually, understanding what is it they care about helping them develop and helping them then stay engaged as a part of this culture that we're creating together. So you know that on many episodes, I've been talking about this concept of emotional intelligence, about our ability or inability to recognize and understand emotions in ourselves and what we know about ourselves, what we're feeling, thinking, seeing in any given situation, and what do we know about ourselves But how can we recognize and understand that also in somebody else? That's the social awareness side of emotional intelligence. But then you've heard me talk about that it doesn't stop there, that it's not just recognition and understanding that of yourself, but it's recognizing and understanding that in another person. And then what is the behavioral response we choose to put into place based on what we know about ourselves and what we know about somebody else? So as I share that again, as, a, as we navigate the generational gap within cultures, it's going to require us to have that kind of emotional intelligence to understand how we're thinking and feeling, but also to seek out how somebody else might be thinking and feeling, how they might be approaching something. And then what is it we're trying to create together? And what are the beha- what's the behavioral response we're going to put into practice in order to create that together? The, the way that we think about other people, the way that we engage with other people, and the way that we identify what we're trying to create intentionally together helps us create that cultural ecosystem. So some questions to ponder for today's episode. How could you and your team drop the generational stereotypes? How could you help feed the ecosystem to attract what people are seeking? And what opportunities exist to tailor the engagement to your people? So I hope today's episode got you thinking in some exciting ways. If a deeper dive would be interesting to you or if we can be added value to your team, your organization, I hope you'll check us out, jasonvbarger.com. Shoot us an email, info at jasonvbarger.com. If you have ideas or future content that you think would be great for us to talk about on future pods, thanks to everybody who engages and chimes in. Uh, I, lastly, I hope you'll go back and listen to past episodes. Again, so many great things. I referenced some of them on here, but check out past episodes. And cheers to you. Cheers to me. Cheers to you, to us, to everyone out there across generations, because the future of leadership is you as me as us. And the future cultures that we create will require all of us. And we have the opportunity to set a temperature and breathe good oxygen into people and to create places that people want to be a part of. So, step back, remember, be a thermostat, and breathe good oxygen. Thank you for listening to today's podcast, and I hope the messages and questions stimulate positive change along your path. As always, if these messages resonate with you and add value to your life, I hope you'll help amplify them throughout the world. Please rate, comment and share on whatever podcast or social media platform you're using and share this podcast with the people in your life or work who should be part of these conversations. That way, this spirit does, in fact, spread. If these messages or developing leaders and culture would be helpful to you and your organization, please contact us at jasonvbarger.com, jasonvbarger.com. And remember, We are all ambassadors for the culture we want to create in our life and work. We have to own the vision we want to be a part of. The future of leadership is you, is me, is us. Be a thermostat.